Welcome back to the show, everyone. Today we've got fun things to talk about, and they're pretty damn serious. If you like, say, what Relic have made in the past, this will be interesting to you. If, of course, you like Creative Assembly, you like the Total War games, this is also going to be interesting. So this is about C8. It's also about the other Western studios owned by Sega. You see, Sega have had a pretty rough time, and there's now been 240 layoffs. This is basically after a quarter where they had releases like Sonic Superstars, Endless Dungeon, and Total War Pharaoh that failed to set the profit sheet ablaze, and because of that, Sega have decided to cut their costs. Creative Assembly are bearing the brunt of this, it seems, and it seems more in England. It doesn't look like their studio in Sofia is, uh, is, is being impacted. The implication here is that staff and projects alike are being abandoned. If we want to see Sega's plans in action, the thing to really look at is Relic Entertainment, because they are a profitable company. We actually have their financial results. They're a profitable company, but they're being sold in order to reduce cost overheads, which will be pretty damn interesting to get into. And per a certain legend of Total War, we can talk about seemingly an empire-scaled game and Warhammer 40k. And that certainly appeals to me, as does today's sponsor. So here's the problem, data leaks all the time, and just like vultures looking for a meal, data brokers exist to harvest this data. And that means, well, we end up with spam or of course worse things. But the good news is we do have the legal right to be removed from data brokers, but the downside is doing so takes hours. And that is where incogni.com forward slash bellular news comes in. So they automate the whole process for you and code bellular news gets you 60% off an annual plan. When I signed up, they immediately found me in 48 data brokers. Brokers. They sent 42 takedown requests, six were completed instantly, and funny enough, the day all that happened, I had got a message from a recruiter, and it was clearly just spam. And funny enough, in the economy dashboard, I could see that my data was on a platform for recruiters. I don't know how it got there, but I certainly didn't want it to be there. And that's a small annoyance. Obviously, we know that these kind of things can get a bit more serious. Whenever there's those big data breaches, the sorts of ones that make the news, the data brokers are out there harvesting it all up. Of course, that means people can then find your information easily on sites like Bean Verified, which is really damn creepy. And even if you do a takedown request yourself, well, your data can just be harvested up again. So with Incogni, they take your data down, but then they continually rescan the brokers over time to keep your data off there automatically. So you can give them a shot today at incogni.com forward slash bellyler news. And with code bellyler news, you will get a 60% discount. So thanks to them for supporting the show, and let's get into it. We gotta kick it off with Sega then. They have tacitly admitted that they released Sonic Superstars far too close to Super Mario Wonder for it to succeed, and they've also decided to carve up their Western operations. Now, as for Sonic, I've gotta be honest with you, yeah, I'm sure Mario was providing some very stiff competition, but take a look at it on Steam, and you'll also see that it's hardly the most positively rated game in existence that might just have something to do with it. But first, let's talk about the layoffs. So these were confirmed via a shareholder update from their Japanese arm on Thursday morning last week. Now, as a reminder, that was one day before the final working day of the financial year. What this is, is balance sheet management ahead of end of year reporting. And the cost of that is them deciding to reduce their headcount by approximately 240 roles at several bases in the European region, they say, with the aim of optimizing their fixed expenses. Which basically means if you're in Creative Assembly, there's a chance that your role is going to be eliminated. Sega Europe, the entity, also seemingly being downsized a bit. There's a smaller contingent from Sonic Dream Team developer Sega Hardlight who are also being let go. Now, Sega were reiterating that this is in fact separate to the 230 layoffs that happened in September of 2023. Now, that's the stuff that correlates with the cancellation of Hyenas and the mass layoff of staff with that. So if you combine these things, we're looking at just shy of 500. Obviously not all of that is in CA, but quite a lot of it is in CA actually. This is the second sweeping wave of layoffs that they've uh, been hit with in a single financial year. And that's rough because if you think about why there was an erosion with the Total War games, like why they were shrinkflating DLC, why Pharaoh was sort of fobbed off as being a full fat, like big historical Total War game, well, uh, that comes down to money. So uh, those pressures are still going to exist. Now, unfortunately for them, as spotted in an email to staff that was then viewed by Eurogamer, 
the Sega Europe head Jurgen Post was legally unable to confirm staff of these cuts in advance, and that basically led to lots of people finding out that they'd been laid off because they saw news reporting of the Japanese update which to them will absolutely suck. And basically, he said, due to the nature of this announcement and our legal obligations in Japan, we were unable to share any detail with you until now. This is far from ideal and means some of you may have read about this in the media or via social networks before seeing the email. If that is the case, I'm sorry. That's one of those tricky things. Does seem cold and heartless, but also, well, they're going to have to comply with the local laws in Japan, right? So. Pretty shitty situation, basically. Now, with the way that the time zones are working out, this essentially means that a lot of staff would have been finding out about this um, before they got out of bed, assuming that uh, they sleep with their phone in reach, which is gonna suck. Now, in addition to this, Sega have also said they've done a further review of in-production titles. They were already doing that. This is, again, separate to the one they did in 2023. So, if, if you happen to be a video game project, your chances of survival are going down. They say, as a result of a review of the mid-term lineup in the European studios, we decided to implement write-downs of work in progress of some titles in development, and as a result, they expect to record a loss of approximately 5.6 billion yen as cost of sales. So all of this is a pretty shitty financial situation. And funny enough, it's shitty financial situations that have led Creative Assembly to getting in a lot of this hot water in the first place. Though, of course, large parts of this are self-inflicted. It, it was not needed to go and try to do hyenas. So overall, this is rough stuff, and it's also in line with what we've seen across the industry, where basically, what are we doing? We're doubling down on safe bets that we think have got a very high chance of success. Now, that does make a lot of financial sense. Thing is, though, often when it comes to the creation of new IP that ends up being a future cash cow, well, you do actually have to take that initial risk. Those are the sorts of projects that are dying. That's why you're going to be seeing less like new IP from really, really big groups. I mean, imagine if Ubisoft wasn't in a risk-taking mood whenever they decided to do the first Assassin's Creed. And cue a change of scenery. I'm no longer in my parents' house because I've got to film. A quick little update for you on this story. That's because right before we published today's video, they actually dropped an update. This is an update on Thrones of Decay, so let's just go into it. Okay, right, this post is from C.A. Freeman, and it says, Hey folks, with the full reveal of Thrones of Decay starting next week and continuing through April, I wanted to talk with you all about some pricing changes that we're making for this DLC that we thought it would be good to share ahead of our usual reveal business. Oh boy, pricing. <laughs> we are going there. Before we get to that, you know, he says, uh, let you know, thank you for the reception of our updated Shadows of Change. And that is fair. What they did with Shadows of Change was good and it reflected them listening. When it first launched, we got it wrong, but you gave us the chance to help address that. And all of us across Total War were grateful for how warmly you embraced the new content we added. We hope the decisions like this help to demonstrate our commitment to improving the relationship we share with you. They then actually reference the story that so far in this video we've been talking about. You may have seen the news from Sega last week of potential changes happening to our teams here at Creative Assembly. No matter the outcome, there will still be a team who love making content for Total War Warhammer 3, and we will, you know, just be continuing to do that. On to the news we have today. We are making a one-time change to the way we'll release Thrones of Decay, and we felt we should talk openly about it before we kick things off. As announced, Throne of Decay welcomes all new content for Empire, Dwarves, and Nurgle, and we're happy to reveal that each faction's new content will be available to purchase as a bundle or on an individual basis. I.e., if you only want to play as Empire, you can buy this section of DLC as a standalone purchase rather than buy everything, allowing you to pick and choose. So here is the deal, right? Thrones of Decay will be available for um, at a complete, you know, bundle discounted price. $22.92 or £19 and 10 pence. Each individual pack will be available for $8.99, £7.49 per pack. If you purchase the packs individually on Steam, you'll receive a 15% discount on the remaining packs when you complete your collection. Hmm, quite a change. Let's continue to see what they say. Back when we got started on productions of Thrones of Decay close to a year ago, oh, that really is putting in the Thrones of Delay, isn't it? Uh, we had envisioned shipping this as one big package, just as we did with Shadows of Change. And after talking with many of you these past months, we recognize these larger sized, higher price packs aren't always what you're looking for. So we decided to do something about it and use this extra time to show that we're listening to what you had to say. And they basically say this is their new approach and they're in pre-production for the next DLC for 
for the game. And they do say, speaking to the wider concerns, we've also been hard at work these last few months realigning our vision of what's yet to come for Warhammer 3. As promised back in December, we'll be back to chat more with uh, where we're going a little while after we launch Thrones of Decay. So interesting times, I think. And before I hop back to the core story about CA, I do want to do just a little bit of price history comparison. So to take a look at Shadows of Change, uh, well, it uh, launched at 2249 USD, uh, though its RRP was 25 bucks. So that was an RRP of 25 bucks. Obviously that didn't miss the mark and they later added content to that. So you're looking at, uh, yeah, a 25 buck price what we get here, though, is a uh, overall bundle price of 22, so basically 23 bucks. So it's ever so slightly cheaper, but then you can buy those individual packs cheaper. One of the things to remember here, right, is generally speaking, the AI is doing like whatever. So when a new DLC comes out, the AI like actually has it. What you're paying for is you being able to play with it. So if one of these basically means that a bunch of stuff is added to the game and you only pay for the bit that you're using, I do think that that is significantly better, actually. I think that is uh, decently consumer-friendly. They're not forcing you to buy an overall larger DLC with things that you're not interested in. I mean, Empire Dwarves and Nurgle. Look, what if you just do not like playing Nurgle? Well, then you could buy Empire and Dwarves. That would cost you $8.99 for the first one, and then, well, 15% off $8.99 for the second one. You'd be getting only what you want, and you certainly would be paying uh, less money. I don't know. I'll have to obviously take a proper dive in here when we see literally what all of the content is for these factions. I will say that my gut feeling is that this is good, and even if the bundle overall was an ever so slightly worse deal, for the majority of consumers being able to buy only the stuff that you actually want for the cheaper price, I think that, uh, you know, that's better. That makes sense. And with a bundle, it's, you know, the way you might see a app on iOS or Android or something, and it will say, but you know, buy monthly $30 or buy an annual thing, $60. And the monthly is priced so that you'd be stupid to buy it. I at least think that they haven't went so expensive with the individual pr uh, pack pricing that it's like that. So this is certainly interesting. I do think for a game like this, if they had a higher cadence of smaller cheaper DLCs that are going to be more focused on just one faction. I could actually see that being a fairly decent thing. So let me know what you think. Certainly after this is done, I'm going to be seeing what Legends, Voland, what the Total War crew, um, you know, content creator wise, what they think about this. And uh, yeah, when we get the full details, if it's newsworthy, we'll make a video here too. All right. Back to the video. This new list of layoffs then that's happened very recently, that's going to be a part of a wider review of Creative Assembly structure, its staff, its development pipelines. Again, maybe thinking about what those medium term projects are. Now, does this mean management specific people have been fired? Uh, not explicitly. Um, there are some cases, and there's been previous reporting around this where senior leadership who I mean, I certainly my personal belief is uh, they've made very bad decisions. I really disagree. Um, there's essentially some of the context is that there's a very entrenched view that Total War has essentially maxed its total addressable market. The Total War cannot really expand, and therefore what it needs to do is get more money out of its current users. And what that has basically mean is lots of DLC and also yearly releases. That's why you basically have Total War Pharaoh, which is sort of taking Troy and, uh, you know, fiddling around with things. And yes, bringing it to that timeline, that part of the world, um, which admittedly is pretty close. Uh, yeah, that's why you kind of end up with situations like that. Where this really started off was Thrones of Britannia. Um, Thrones of Britannia was a, if my memory serves anyway, um, a spin-off of Attila. And it did not have a particularly great launch. Now, it did do some cool things with, you know, settlements, some siege battles were pretty cool, but it had balance issues. It just didn't really seem to be fully baked. And of course, as has really been a theme with quite a lot of the Saga's games, essentially your unit diversity is not humongous. They are definitely smaller in scope games compared to the likes of, say, Empire, Rome, Medieval 2, right? Those absolutely massive projects. So, a lot of this thinking then, I mean, I believe in particular, like Rob Bartholomew, he's the person who has most clearly kind of 
um, I suppose, had his name attached to things. This has, of course, been via people who either worked in the past or currently work at the company speaking to people. So as for Rob, I don't actually think he's been fired, but it does look like he has been sort of shuffled around somewhere else. One of the things basically that's leaked is a email of um, people on the brand team essentially talking about Rob no longer having his role and uh, any things that would go to Rob then being directed to the person who sent that email that then ended up leaking. So that kind of thing has been going on and the broader context here is that entrenched belief that Total War has basically hit its cap. What I would certainly say there is, I play way less Total War than I did in the past. I played a shitload of Shogun 2, a shitload of Fall of the Samurai, um, a good bit of a good bit of Rome uh, too, good bit of Attila, good bit of Napoleon, a lot of Napoleon actually. Um, I mean, really er everything prior to that, a lot of, but recently, like not so much, and I do prefer the uh, the sort of older style of uh, I guess the older engine. It's that whole you know shift to to Warscape that was cert or Warscape two whatever is the most recent version of the engine. Uh, for whatever reason, I just don't really feel that melee combat kind of hits the way that it used to in past Total Wars. I think there's issues there that we didn't really notice as much when you were dealing with, you know, mass or sort of firearm uh, battles. But when you're going into Rome 2 and everything just descends into a blob, it's a real pain in the ass. Now, Rome 2 can be an amazing game. And there's many great, like, you know, bones of an amazing game in there. Um, and Emperor Edition or whatever it's called certainly does make that better. But really, it's looking at, say, Divide at Impera and a lot of the mods. Um, I think uh, Bar... Imperium Seractum is one for Rome Total War Remastered that's really impressive as well. So the modders are doing amazing work, and in my past uh, analysis of the situation, essentially, Creative Assembly are being outcompeted by themselves from the past. Like, yeah, people are playing plenty of the Warhammer games. Not as much as they used to, though in the, the peak days, because Warhammer 3, not a good launch, lots of problems. But ultimately, thinking about their belief that it is capped, well, if you were to do a Medieval 3, if you were to do a more modern crack at a game like Empire, yes, that would obviously be extremely expensive, but I actually do feel like that is the sort of thing that could expand the audience, because it does seem that a lot of innovation has been lost in service of essentially just getting more product out, be that saga titles, be that DLCs. And in a lot of the reporting, well, what we heard about was essentially lots of technical debt, different titles within the Total War franchise being in different builds of the engine, that they essentially had this core technology group who were supposed to be sort of laying the foundations for the future, but essentially always ended up just having to firefight in titles. And that kind of meant that the foundations of the franchise didn't really go anywhere. So whenever they say they think the franchise is completely capped, I would say, uh, no, you just haven't given people absolutely humongous, big, exciting reasons to come back to the franchise. Now on that, people told Legends some pretty damn interesting things. So essentially a world spanning Napoleonic game or maybe post Napoleonic game, I suppose maybe going max into like Crime uh, Crimean War, that sort of thing. Anyway, apparently one of those world spanning. So again, think Empire. Apparently that's in the works. Apparently there is also a Warhammer 40k game, which to me would be extremely exciting. I think that the 40k setting has got that, uh, well, it just has that mix of melee and, uh, and ranged uh, combat that's just, to me, I'm just naturally more interested in it than Warhammer Fantasy, even though I think they're both great. So look, if you have a Warhammer 40k Total War game, I'm by default really interested in that. If you have a world-spanning Napoleonic game, I mean, come on, my comfort food is watching Sharp. I'm going to be down for that sort of thing. And if these are supposed to be coming out within the next year or two, that would very much imply that these have been in development prior to the problems of last year. And that likely means that they are far along enough in terms of development that, um, well, any meaningful changes will have to fight the inertia of their starting positions. So that to me seems like those are probably safer projects as well. If I was thinking about this from a very, very mercenary perspective of what will actually get the brand out there, what could create sub franchises within the brand. Well, I absolutely think given I believe that 40k is quite a bit more popular online than Warhammer Fantasy um, and Age of Sigmar for uh, for that matter. So because of that, yeah, 
I, I think those are absolutely the sorts of games that I would keep. And if you're going to be doing a world-spanning Napoleonic uh, era game or just, you know, 1800s in general, honestly, I think that plays more to the strengths of their current engine than the weaknesses of their current engine. Now, could these still be cancelled? I mean, yes, absolutely. If I was to imagine that one would be cancelled, it probably would be the 1800s one, purely because everybody knows just how big, right? Just how big 40k is right now. To the point where, you know, as much as there's all the meme stocks and Tesla had its crazy run, hey, if you just put your money in, like, I don't know, Greg's the Bakery and uh, Games Workshop, you'd be a very happy investor. Warhammer's big. Anyway, I think they would probably keep that kind of thing. Ultimately, though, we do have to remember that one of the flashpoints that created this was shrinkflation. Regarding the DLC, they needed to charge more money for less content, and they needed to make the content more cheaply. That didn't go well, and while they have made, like, I think pretty good attempts, they are still being hit by delays and that sort of thing. You know, throne of delay. Kind of rough. But that's not it. That's not it. We now have got to talk about Relic Entertainment. Man, Relic are a storied studio. So many of us have played their games. I mean, Dawn of War, like as an example, they're pretty damn incredible. So what's happening here is Relic Entertainment are being spun out from Sega. And this actually means they're independent. And they're independent for the first time since they were acquired by THQ in 2004. Do you remember THQ? So THQ gobbled them up in 2004, THQ then went bankrupt nine years later, that's when Sega acquired them. Now, Sega had already laid off 121 employees from the company in May of 2023. That was following the launch of Company of Heroes 3, which basically reviewed well with critics, but it, look, it lacked polish lacked features, lacked content, the sorts of things that the actual core fan base of that series was really hungry for, it lacked that kind of stuff. And that meant that it did sell softly. So they're going independent and that's actually done with the aid of a currently unnamed external investor. Yeah, they're being released to being a fully independently run studio. To be honest with you, I think that's really cool. They say to our fans, we want to assure you we will continue to support our titles, including Company of Heroes 3. They say they're looking forward to the 1.6 update in April. And uh, they, of course, you know, thanks Sega on the way out, which, uh, you know, of course, they're going to be doing that kind of thing. So overall, good. I mean, we've seen the downsides of consolidation over the last while. I mean, hey, if Creative Assembly just kind of decided, hey, we're Total War, we're going to do the Total War thing, let's just make the best damn Total War possible, and uh, maybe they didn't have the sorts of incentives that led to their missteps, I mean, I would say their missteps, um, over the last decade, well, maybe we would be in a different situation. So I'm actually really excited that uh, Relic are going to be independent. Where it gets interesting, though, is when we actually take a look at the numbers. So you might be asking the question, why would Sega spin them off, right? Why would Sega let them go? Um, and why would they do it now, even though they've already conducted layoffs, presumably with games in the pipeline? And the answer here is really simple. They were profitable, but they weren't profitable enough, and they were not creating video games fast enough. So we can take a look here. This is Sega's own report to their investors uh, talking about the sale of this asset, right? So to take a look here, and bear in mind these numbers are in thousands of CAD, your sales are 52,722. That goes up to 55.7 the next year, and then most recently, 62.284. So, the line is, in fact, folks, going up. Problem is, um, it's the wrong line that's going up because the other one, the very important one of net income, is, uh, in fact, going down from 11.9 to 10.3 to 8.2. That's not a particularly uh, lovely trend line. So that's basically what's up. They're making money. They're in a profit. But it's not enough. And basically, it's not enough for Sega to deem it worthy of them just bothering with the overall asset. Now, in terms of their recent releases, in October 2021, they released Age of Empires 4. In February 23, they released Company of Heroes 3. Now, if you compare those with the charts above, and of course, remember that Age of Empires 4 was made on spec for Microsoft, so income would already likely take a cut there, you basically see increasing sales, that is a clear sign that Relic is a company that is kind of living in its back catalog, its expansions, but lower income each year, right? It's not losses, it's just lower income. And that's kind of saying that the money that they are spending right now 
their most recent developments, those things are not moving the needle enough. And ultimately, that's why Sega is looking at the likes of Relic, looking at Creative Assembly, and basically saying, okay, we need to trim down CA even more, but we still are going to keep them on because they think the Total War ultimately can go the distance. But for Relic, they're not worth the effort. I don't know about you, but certainly I'm a lifelong fan of real-time strategy games. Command and Conquer, Age of Empires 2, Age of Empires 1, even playing that on the school library computer. Don't even know why the hell the thing was even on the school library computer, but it was. Um, that's what I grew up with. So, to be honest, the idea of Relic just being out there, being independent, that's really exciting to me. Even though, yes, of course, I will admit, not everything has been amazing. I mean, Dawn of War 3, right? Um, in February of 2018, they said that they and Sega would be ending updates for Dawn of War. Dawn of War 3 was a uh, pretty uh, unsuccessful release, to, uh, to put it charitably. So ultimately then, that's it. Relic ain't Creative Assembly. They don't have a support team in Sophia that can push smaller, cheaper titles. Of course, Sophia is going to be a cheaper place to develop games than uh, the United Kingdom. They don't have that. They don't have as rich a back catalog of games and DLC that are passively generating revenue. Look, if Dawn of War 3 was just a game with a really long tail, sure. Dawn of War 3 was great. If uh, everything came out great with Company of Heroes 3, maybe we'd be in a different position. But Sega ran their own numbers, they realized what the probabilities were, they decided no. And on the topic of deciding no, something that is going to be fairly rough. One other thing that was passed to Legend, one of his sources said that DLC support for Total War Warhammer 3 will be over fairly soon with maybe six DLCs left. Again, six DLCs, and um, they're probably not all going to be the size of, say, the Chaos Dwarves race pack. Yeah, they're clearly seeing declining sales. They tried to do what they did with Shadows of Change, that shit didn't work. Obviously, whatever uh, arithmetic is there behind the development cost and uh, what they think they can make from those DLCs. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's fairly rough. Now, look, I do think that a 40k Total War is probably coming. That just makes sense to me. I think a lot of the people who enjoy Warhammer 3 will probably end up enjoying the 40k one, though I would be a little bit cautious because, again, I look at Warhammer 3, I look at the campaign that it shipped with, and there are severe design questions there. Sources told me in an email um, that like, people internally were saying, this is not a great campaign. This ain't going to work. People are not going to enjoy this. Yet it launched. And uh, funny enough, those people who are trying to blow that whistle internally, they were right. Um, I would certainly hope then that those lessons have been internalized before they uh, have a 40k game. Because if the 40k game comes out and it just has its main campaign, and you know, we're not talking about its equivalent of Immortal Empires or anything like that, well, then that could be a truly tricky situation for Creative Assembly, who, we must remember, do not exist to make games for you or me. They do not exist to generate, you know, value for um, for the company itself and the sh people who own the company. No. It, it, it exists right now to make money for Sega's shareholders. For a long time, Creative Assembly did that. It's been getting more tricky, and that's why we're in the situation that we're in today. What's the way out? Honestly, I think it's pretty damn simple. It's to not be fatalistic. It's to say, nope, Total War can be bigger. In fact, to get more people in, we need to entice them in by properly investing. Fix up your melee combat. Put a lot more work into the engine. And of course, that is easy for me to say when I'm sitting here as a, you know, complete literal armchair dev. I have no idea um, what's really going on in there. Like, we only have fragments from sources, other than we're pretty sure it's a technical debt ridden shit show. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you have this release schedule that is saying yearly Total War games on all of the DLCs, to the point where your internal technology development group can't really just build a good solid foundation of your engine because they're continually having to firefight things, as sources have suggested. Well, to me, that does not seem like a recipe for making a game that will surprise and delight and ultimately will grow the size of that brand. Indeed, a recent video that we did in this channel was actually covering a lot of games finding success by going to a lower price point and trying to basically expand the size of their audience. So very much, that's uh, that's not shrinkflation. And when people look at Total War Pharaoh, they think shrinkflation. When they look at what was attempted with those DLCs for Warhammer 3, they think shrinkflation. And if that is what is in people's minds, you're never going to truly grow your brand again. I hope they choose the daring and frankly, the exciting path. 
to make the sorts of games that actually make a ripple again in the industry. Because make no mistake, Creative Assembly was an industry leading, innovative company, pioneered a genre. There is nothing that would make me happier than to see a true return to that form. That's it for today's video. And if you want to join me for a chat about what's going on with the price of video games, check out this video next.